Oh, I'm not next. <laughs> that would be fun to switch. That was terrific. Thank you. So I want to talk about some of the research being done um, with my research team at the Center for the Built Environment, which is an industry university research consortium at UC Berkeley. So I'd like you to imagine for a moment what would life be like if we ate the same foods every day, never experienced weather or changing light patterns, listened to constant monotone sounds, and didn't have art to delight our senses. It would be pretty awful. But that's basically what we're doing when we design for static, uniform, neutral conditions in the built environment. And I think this is far from enjoyable. So the problem is when we put people in centrally controlled environments with a one-size-fits-all approach, you're bound to fail. You all want something different than each other. I want something different at different times of the day, depending on what I'm doing or if I just got back for lunch and maybe I'm feeling lethargic. Now this picture, which is my favorite Doonesbury cartoon, um, might show a, a sort of a, the facility manager's nightmare of all of these different complaints. But I also see this differently. I saw see this these people as a finely tuned network of sensors. And the challenge is just to collect this information in a systematic way. Now at CBE, we do a lot of physical measurements. At the moment, I'm going to focus on our subjective surveys. We've developed a web-based survey that's now been used in over 1,000 buildings by over 150,000 occupants. We have a number of standardized set of questions with scaled responses. We have a lot of branching questions that enable you to dive deeper into sources of dissatisfaction. And of course, a lot of open-ended opportunities for comments because those are very revealing. We've also developed a number of data mining and um, automated reporting tools that allow you to compare the performance of your building not only to this benchmarking database overall, but you can choose to compare it to a set of buildings with particular characteristics. Now, this is just one high-level summary of some of these results in office buildings in particular. On the left side, you see the different categories of questions. Along the bottom are classic seven-point satisfaction scale. The legend here shows that these bars represent the 25th to 75th percentile responses. The red dot and blue dot bar are the mean and median, um, respectfully. And it's interesting to note that all of the indoor environmental quality, or IEQ measures, are at the bottom. So we're really not doing a very good job of creating acceptable environments in our um, workplaces. So while well, I could go on at length about the survey results and how we slice it and dice it in a different way, in my short time here, I want to put out a few ideas that we think have great potential for enhancing experience in the workplace. And for the sake of brevity, I'm going to focus on the thermal environment, but there's a lot of analogies to other attributes of the environment. And I'm going to mostly show you just some eye candy photos and speak verbally about the research results rather than go through a lot of graphs. So the first idea, I think we need to move away from space-based, centrally co controlled conditioning and move towards more localized, person-based conditioning and ventilation strategies that allow people to have personal control. So at CBE, we've been spending years developing very low energy personal comfort systems. We've developed a desktop fan that uses only three watts of energy, foot warmers that use only 30 watts compared to what people usually bring into their office, which are 1,000 watt heaters that they buy from the local hardware store. And our favorite example, not shown here, is a heated and cooled chair, which operates on rechargeable batteries so it can be untethered. It uses only 14 watts of energy in the heating mode, 4 watts of energy in cooling mode. And um, the most exciting thing is about these strategies is that in our lab and field studies, we have demonstrated that we've been able to achieve 90% occupant acceptability over a 20 degree Fahrenheit ambient temperature range from 64 to 84 degrees. So the opportunity to enhance both energy performance and comfort performance is phenomenal. We're very excited about that. And the chair actually just hit the market in the last month. Second idea. 
Current standards, um, Charlene referred to ASHRAE standards, current standards restrict air movement. They promote still air conditions because of fear of cold drafts. These were based on laboratory studies done in Scandinavian countries where they put people in the laboratory, blew cold air at the back of their neck, and asked them if they liked it. <laughs> the relevance of these experiments to real world situations just boggles the mind. In contrast, we have found over and over again in field studies that more people are asking for more air movement, not less, and in both seasons, and even when they're feeling slightly cool. It's not just, I'm too warm, I need to be cooler. They find air motion um, satisfactory because it's refreshing. We've also found in the lab that air motion improves perceived air quality for the exact same physical conditions of the air and thermal environment. So there's some implications there as well. We're also doing work on a concept called allesthesia, which is the physiological basis for thermal delight. And in brief, what we're finding is that in order to get to these higher levels of thermal pleasure, you need some degree of contrast and variability. Um, and so it turns out that what you need to do is the body actually, we have lots of examples in recreation, the body actually needs to be in some state of non-neutrality, slightly warm, slightly cool, with a stimulus to bring you back to neutrality to actually give you those higher levels of pleasure. The design challenge is just how far do we allow the body to deviate from neutrality in order to create that. All right? It's kind of like the analogy of just how hungry do you have to be to enhance the taste of food, or just how long does your sweetheart have to be away for you to be really excited to see him or her again. <laughs> the last one is a bit of back to the future, all right? and this also has a lot of associations with biophilic design and connection to nature. We have found that in mixed mode buildings that combine natural ventilation with some judicious form of air conditioning, um, that we have much higher levels of occupant satisfaction than in sealed air conditioned buildings. There's also been a really interesting study by Sepanon and Fisk that looked at multiple studies totaling 23,000 people in six countries that found that there was 30 to 200 percent higher prevalence of sick building syndrome symptoms in air conditioned buildings compared to naturally ventilated buildings. So in closing, I think one of the things we need to do to enhance the good while we're trying to avoid the bad is to find ways to reward good buildings, not just for their aesthetic beauty, not just for their technical performance of low energy, but also for their ability to enhance the experiential performance for the occupants. Thank you. <laughs>